Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Welcome to the 2021 Cartoon Crossroads Columbus keynote conversation with Allison Bechdel and Hillary Price. Yes, please. <laughs> Clap. <laughs> well worth some applause. It's nice to be all here together tonight. I'm Melanie Korn, president of Columbus College of Art and Design, and it's a pleasure to have you here on campus. We are thrilled to host tonight's discussion featuring these two accomplished comics creators and look forward to them not only talking comics, but their shared interest in physical exercise and play, which is illustrated in Allison's latest book, The Secret to Superhuman Strength. Word has it that last time that Allison and Hillary were both in Columbus, they took each other on in an arm wrestling contest. And while I make no promises about them repeating that particular feat of strength tonight, I expect tonight's conversation will be equally memorable. CXC has been hosting comics legends and innovators since the very start, and I am delighted that CCAD has been part of CXC since its first year. Our faculty, students, and alumni have played important parts in CXC, uh, since the festival's inception, and this year is no different, with CCAD fa family members involved in planning the event, leading educational sessions, creating this year's poster art. That's Gabby Metzler, a 2017 grad who's in the audience tonight. And, of course, tabling at the expo tonight, you got to see some of our comic seniors tabling right here in Kinzani Auditorium, or uh, Atrium. I'd like to extend our sincere thanks to CXC's Interim Executive Director, Jersey Drozd, and all of those who helped make this festival a success. I know that many of you here tonight are familiar already with CCAD, but for those who aren't, please give me a short moment to just tell you a little bit about us. CCAD is one of the oldest nonprofit art and design colleges in the United States. We were founded by five women in 1879 and now have 1,000 students across 12 BFA programs and an MFA program. And soon, we will add a new graduate program, our first of its kind, Master of Professional Studies in Retail Design. Our mission is similar to CXE's, to foster a diverse community that educates students so they can unleash their creative power to shape culture and commerce. Specifically, graduates from our Comics and Narrative Practice program go on to work as independent artists, writers, publishers, comics illustrators, colorists, letterers, storyboard artists, and character developers for comics, animation, gaming, and toys. But of course, our scope goes beyond comics and even beyond degree-seeking students. Our Saturday morning art classes help school-aged children and teens grow a love for art and design. And more recently, we've expanded our array of classes for adults to include courses that allow them to explore their creative skills as well as to help them enhance their resumes. And that's not all. Our Visiting Artists and Scholars series features innovative artists, designers, and thinkers whose talks are always free and open to the public. And upcoming events in this series, some of which you may have seen on the slides, include a panel discussion on mental health, systemic racism, and young black artists, designers, and activists, hosted by author, activist, and MacArthur genius, Hanif Abdurraqib, on Tuesday, October 19th. This panel discussion will focus on the mental health challenges encountered by the BIPOC community, especially those who are young creatives and activists. And the discussion will include the unique intersectional and systemic prejudices that oppress LGBTQIA people and, and communities of color. The following month, on Thursday, November 14th, we'll hear from Dory Tunstall. Dr. Tunstall is Dean of the Faculty of Design at Ontario College of Art and Design University in Toronto, Canada, and the first black person to be Dean of a Faculty of Design anywhere in the world. In the President's lecture, she'll join us via Zoom to discuss her mission to redesign design education in an effort to decouple the practice from colonialism and create design with respect. Again, these activities are all free and open to the public, as is our CCAD Knows Retail lecture series, which brings together industry innovators to discuss where the field is and where it's heading. Finally, as you joined us tonight, you passed by the Beeler Gallery right out here in Kinzani. And Beeler Gallery plays, a ho plays host to an array of contemporary and experimental art and design exhibitions. Admission is always free and open to the public. If you haven't gotten the hint, we're trying to welcome you back again and again here. Uh, and I encourage you to pay a visit to the gallery. Uh, 
Okay, I know that's a lot to take in, uh, and you can learn more about these events uh, and other items on our calendar by simply visiting ccad.edu slash calendar. So um, go there, check out these events, sign up for our news, news and events emails, and you will always know what's going on here at the college. So finally, to conclude, back to tonight's program, I also want to just say how personally excited I am to hear from Bechdel and Price, spending most of my 20s and 30s in the queer community of the San Francisco Bay Area, Dykes to Watch Out For, the Bechdel Test, as well as Rhymes with Orange, all hold a special place in my heart. And now I'd like to hand things over to Associate Professor Lauren McCubbin, Chair of both CCAD's Illustration and Comics and Narrative Practice programs, to tell you a little bit more about our school, our alumni, and our involvement in this year's CXC, as well as in to introduce tonight's speakers. Lauren? Thank you, Dr. Korn. Uh, for my freshmen in the audience, this is the first time you have seen my entire face. <laughs> it's very exciting for all of us. It's very exciting for all of us to be here in person. It is uh, an amazing experience after so long away to be able to sit around face to face without the computer screen in between us talking about comics and craft and uh, the things that bring us together, these kinds of stories. And I am very, very excited to be able to welcome to, uh, to CCAD tonight uh, both Alison Bechdel and Hillary Price. Um, some of you know who Alison Bechdel is from Fun Home, the musical. I'm not going to sing, I promise. <laughs> some of you know her from, like I did, growing up with Dykes to Watch Out For, her long-running cartoon series. Um, the thing that I think I, everyone knows some way about the Bechdel test, and uh, in case you did not, in case you're the one person in the room, I see you, I will let you know what that is. It is where a character in one of the Dyke to Watch Out For comics won't see a movie unless, one, it has a woman in it, two, they talk to each other about three, something other than a man. And then the character then bemoans the fact that the last film she was able to see was Alien. <laughs> that was my favorite movie the year it came out, so I felt like Allison was talking directly to me. And that is the thing about Allison being here that I am very excited about. Her insights about queer community and popular culture were treasured by the queer community growing up, and it was amazing to see her kind of get more mainstream acceptance with the publication of Fun Home in 2008. I wrote it down right. Um, oh, wait, nope, I messed that up. 2006. Y'all, <laughs> it's been a week. Um, then uh, this was adapted to a Tony Award winning musical, which was just like, amazing Tony award-winning musical about life for a queer kid growing up in a funeral home. America's amazing. Um, and then this was followed by her second incredibly touching memoir, Are You My Mother? And, and, and then in 2012, Alison Bechtel won the MacArthur Genius Grant. That was the year I started paying attention to the MacArthur Genius Grants. <laughs> This year sees the publication of Allison's new book, The Secret to Superhuman Strength. I am incredibly excited to hear the conversation that she is going to have with cartoonist and fellow artist Hilary Price. Please welcome our keynote speaker, Allison Bechdel and Hilary Price. see. Um, thank you, Crossroads Columbus and CCAD for inviting us to come tonight. And we've been treated so well, and everyone's been so friendly, and we've seen such interesting programs at, CS at CXC this, uh, this weekend. So just a big shout out to all of the folks that organized. Uh, Jeff's in the audience and, and Lauren. I mean, people have just gone out of their way 
So your community is really special. Thank you. Yeah. Some, someone said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so welcome, Allison. <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. Uh, so on paper, we have some things in common. We're both lesbians. We're both cartoonists. We're both athletes. And most importantly, people always want to add an extra L to our names. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, but our approaches, our approaches to cartooning and athletic pursuits are very, very different, so I'm really excited to be talking to you about this this evening. So uh, the title of your new book is The Secret to Superhuman Strength, and it chronicles the lifetime pursuit of sweating yourself into oblivion. Uh, to put you at ease, I've put our talk into a structure that I think you're going to be uh, very familiar with. Uh -oh. So, yeah. Here we go, she hasn't seen this. Allison Bechtel, CXC 2021 workout. We're starting with That's a warm up, great. then we're gonna do a body pump, some reps, some heavy lifting, some technique, some stretching, and a cool down. Okay. You ready? Whoa. Whoa. Which one was that? <laughs> so we're gonna start, since this isn't an athletic event, but more a speaking event, we're gonna start with a light verbal warm up. Okay. So please say toy boat 10 times fast. Toy boat, 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 toy boat. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna just get a little bit more complex. All right. So I want you to repeat after me. I'm gonna do it fast first, and then we're gonna do it line by line. Oh my god. And then you're gonna do it all by yourself, okay? All right. I, I'm not the pheasant plucker, I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm only plucking pheasants till the pheasant plucker comes. Oh my God. Ready? I'm, I'm not, not the, the pheasant, pheasant pluck plucker. plucker. I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I'm only plucking pheasants. I'm only plucking pheasants. Till the pheasant plucker comes. Till the pheasant plucker comes. All right, now you do. I'm not the pheasant plucker, I'm the pheasant plucker's son. I forget what comes next. I'm only, <laughs> I'm only plucking pheasants till the pheasant plucker comes. Very good. I did not get warned about this. No. <laughs> so we met uh, for the f for really the first uh, extended time at uh, the precursor to CXC uh, back in 2007. And I thought it would be fun for you to tell the audience the story of uh, how we met. <laughs> you and Paige Braddock of the Jane Comics. Mm -hmm. Jane's World Comics. Jane's World. Mm -hmm. You were both here, and we decided we would hang out after dinner. After your we had We had dinner. We had dinner, yeah. We had hamburgers. Mm -hmm. We went back to Paige's room. Mm -hmm. There was some drinking. And then there was arm wrestling. Right. And in fact, I happen to have some photographic evidence of that. So, oh God. that's Paige Braddock. And there's our very own Allison Bechtel. And, um, oh, no. <laughs> here they are. It's all coming back to me. Uh, now, before we go on, I, votes from the audience. Who do, you th who do you think won? Do you think Paige won or Allison? Allison? Okay, all right. So here she is. She's really like getting it going. Oh, look at that. Oh, oh. And yet, at the very end, defeat! Defeat! She's much bigger than me. You work out a lot. I don't know. I don't know. So, um, what was fun is that after that, it turned into a drawing jam. So, um, Pa uh, Paige would do one, one thing, Allison would do the next, and I would do the last one. So here's one of the G-rated versions of that. <laughs> so that's Paige and Allison. And then there's ESPN1, there's ESPN2, and now there's LESPN. <laughs> so I feel like that story encapsulates a lot of the themes in your book. Um, there's <laughs> tests of strength, there's drawing, there's alcohol. And so let's move on to the body pump section. 
<laughs> of our of our time together, and you've got some slides to share okay. with the audience. I do. Uh, to talk about the themes. All right. So, I'm just going to talk for a few seconds and show you some pictures from my new book. Um, uh oh. Oh. Oh, oh, this is a, a picture I did of Hillary and her partner when they brought my partner and me a badminton net. <laughs> uh, and here's Hillary and me, Nordic skating last winter. Uh, when I got the idea, Hillary, you should do this talk with me mm -hmm. at CXC. And here we are. Yeah. See those skates? They're like cross country ski boots on uh, blades. Oh. <laughs> this is Hillary pushing Kristen her partner on a what's that thing? I couldn't find the version where I slowed this down and put the chariots of fire music. <laughs> All right, enough chit chat, enough uh, drollery. <laughs> so, so. Um, my new book is called The Secret to Superhuman Strength, and the title comes from my childhood fascination with those bodybuilding ads in all the comic books that we had as children, you know, the Charles Atlas uh, ads. And after years of reading those as a small child and being tempted by them, I finally succumbed to this one that was promising me the secret to superhuman strength, which I don't think I need to tell you did not actually impart the secret to superhuman strength. But I remained fascinated with the idea that there, there might be some way to get superhuman strength. And I sort of decided I wanted to figure out how to get it. So in this book, I talk about many different activities I've pursued over the course of my life, skiing, calisthenics, running, karate in my 20s, yoga, biking, all this stuff, weightlifting, backcountry skiing, the famous seven minute workout. <laughs> I tried to do that today in the park, and my app didn't work anymore, so I, had to, I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, insanity. Um, and, but, the, but the real thing that the book is about is not these activities, um, but the, the way that feeling of working out intensely that you might experience as runner's high or that intense focus of, of an activity um, like, that's the thing I'm really getting at. And that, and that feeling for me also translates into my creative life. Like I have that same feeling of intense heightened focus, if I'm lucky, when I'm working. It doesn't come as easily as it does with sports, which is kind of why I do sports. It's sort of a cheating, quick way to get there. And it doesn't happen to me as much as it did when I was little. When it was, I was little, it was just always this kind of flow state of drawing, just drawing whatever came out of my head. And now, in middle age, in late middle age, it is much more difficult to get to that state. Um, so one of the things this book is about is how creativity works. And I got interested in other writers and a couple sets of different writers who also sort of talked about creativity as a theme, like the um, British romantics. This is. William and Dorothy Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, those guys really interested me. They loved being outside and walking and hiking all the time, and their, their writing was very much about the landscape they were spending time in. And those guys inspired these people, the, the American transcendentalists. This is Emerson, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson on the right and Margaret Fuller. Um, these were other people who took a lot of pleasure in being outside and nature and f feeling that there was something transcendent in that experience. Emerson talked about how his self would disappear when he was sometimes out, out in nature. And a friend of his drew this famous cartoon of, uh, oh, he, he described it as being a transparent eyeball, like as if his body went away and he was just seeing things. But his friend drew this kind of quite silly cartoon. And Margaret Fuller, too, had a, an experience of herself receding, of, her, of, of real, realizing that her self didn't matter, that having a self, in fact, was a source of suffering. And I really identify with that. Um, I also write in this book about Jack Kerouac and his, it, I, 
I don't, I haven't read a lot of his work. I only like his book, The Dharma Bums, in which he goes on this hike up a mountain in the Sierras with Gary Snyder, the poet, and they talk about Buddhism the whole way. But they, they too are experiencing a kind of self-transcendence in, in this nature trip. I've tried to meditate. Uh, oh, these guys both were seriously studying Zen at the time that they did their hike. And I um, have a very tortured history with meditation. It's never <laughs> gone well. But it's all inspired by this um, psilocybin mushroom trip I had when I was 21 in Central Park. <laughs> when I really, I, it was like a mystical experience, but of course it was drug-induced. But I really understood that my self was not a real thing. That um, my self, the idea of myself was just something, in fact, that was keeping me separate from everything else in the world. So I'm always trying to get that feeling back. Uh, and that's kind of what this book is about. Uh, so this is why I go out and ski and run and all that stuff, because I want to get that feeling back. OK, that's all. <laughs> So there, there, as Allison said, there are many, many themes in this book. And um, I noticed that when I would listen to other interviewers ask you about this book, it was almost like a Rorschach test of what they were into. Audie Corner said at NPR was like, let's talk about menopause. Um, <laughs> Ross Chast, you talked about certain artists. Um, and so just to be up front, uh, my Rorschach is sports women and comics, and hopefully over the course of this conversation that will sound less shallow than it does right now. <laughs> but um, let's talk a little bit about sports and comics, because they're so fused in this book, and stereotypically the art world doesn't intersect with the athletic world. Like, so, I mean, CCAD has this hilarious <laughs> um, hat that says uh, CCAD, uh, undefeated since 1879 in athletics. <laughs> I have not seen that. It's good. Um, so do you talk sports with your arty friends or you talk art with your sporty friends? I don't, you know, I don't really consider, you, you introduced us both as athletes, but I don't really identify as an athlete. Well, tell us. I mean, I like, to me an athlete is, is someone who plays team sports and stuff like you do. Like you're a jock. I'm not a jock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Like, you know how to chit-chat on the field and stuff. I can't do that. OK. So, so then how would you describe? And your book, uh, you describe yourself, if she was in the 17th, 18th century or 19th century, would be vigorous. Yes. But people would stare at you funny that, these days. You know, it's funny. I, I, it was hard trying to figure out a word. I, don't, I, I think I talked about myself as an exercise enthusiast. I guess I, guess I would say that. Like, it's exercise more than sports or athletics. OK. Well, so what's I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> Exercise enthusiast? All right. What's interesting is that back in the 80s, when you were uh, a, a young adult, there were, very f there were very few avenues to meet other gay women. Oh, right. I had to play team sports. I forgot. And I blocked <laughs> it all out. <laughs> I played softball, I played soccer, and I played a really hellish season of rugby. Seriously? Yeah. How come those aren't in the book? I tried to get them in, and they just wouldn't fit. Oh, interesting. But I only, I did not enjoy them. It was only for the socializing. And so did it, did it work? Uh, well, it gave me something to do, and I met people. You met people, you met other, you met, met other lesbians? Yeah, right. yeah. All right. So also back in the day, women's self-defense classes oh, yeah. were really big. And I, I don't know if today, but we were all um, trained to walk home from a party with our keys uh, <laughs> in, in our fists yeah. like pokey brass knuckles. <laughs> and in, in the Charles Atlas ad in a comic book, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, this trope. Um, in comic yeah, books. Yeah, I don't know if young people know about it. Well, why don't you describe what happens in, in this very uh, typical uh, ad? 
Well, it's, it's a little weak guy gets sand kicked on him by a big strong guy, and the little weak guy is angry, and he goes home, and he sends away for the Charles Atlas workout program, and he builds himself up. I don't know how long it takes. Seems to happen very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes to the beach, and the guy with kicks sand on his girlfriend, and the little skinny guy, who's now a big guy, hits the big guy, and all the women are really happy. <laughs> so when there's some righteousness to that. Yeah, so it's a David and Goliath sort of story. So how, I guess my question then is, how does your pursuit of strength intersect with your feminism oh God. or your sense of justice or wanting to be empowered, uh, an empowered woman? Well, that's a good question because I do feel like it's a very slippery slope from bodybuilding and fitness to fascism. <laughs> I mean, every fascist has an exercise regimen. Um, but, and, but for me, as a, as a girl growing up, I just hated, it was the 60s, it was like, just, uh, just this like stew of misogyny. You couldn't like swing a cat without some horrible joke about how stupid or inept women were. But the thing that I really hated most was this idea that women were weak. Because um, I didn't feel weak as a kid. You know, I was as strong as my brothers. Um, so that's why, uh, that's in part why those ads were so appealing to me, like these really big guys who weren't going to take any shit from anyone. I love that idea. But what, what I've learned over the course of my life is that that's not real strength. I mean, I think we live in a culture where many, many people think that is real strength, but in fact, real strength is very much the opposite of brute strength. Um, but it's interesting just trying to sort those out. And as a woman, I've, you know, I've been in an unusual position. Like, I, I wanted to be stronger. I wanted to learn how to fight. Uh, but I didn't, what I found out was I didn't, I didn't really want to learn how to fight. Who, you have to spend all your time fighting. Well, talk about, talk about your, there's, there's a sequence in the book where you talk about your martial arts, which you were super into, a into, and then how that kind of came crashing down. Well, yeah, it kind of seems like it comes crashing down when this thing happens. <laughs> but I think it would have come crashing down anyhow. But I, I trained in karate for several years. I got a black belt, and um, so it, do I, is this a good story? Uh, well, is that is that what you're asking me to tell? Is that story? I I think it's an interesting story about. Yes, that's the story I'm asking you to tell. Okay. <laughs> so I got, like an old married couple. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got my black belt, and I, I even though I was very very fit and working out all the time, I also was drinking a lot and getting high a lot, which is because I was in my 20s. I just, that's just what I did. And one night, soon after I got my black belt, I was quite wasted out in New York City with some friends, walked to the subway, went down the stairs, and as I went down the subway stairs, I felt somebody grope my butt. And I was really pissed off, and I wheeled around on the stairs, and I said, what, what are you doing? Ah. And this other, this guy, like, equally as wasted as I was, also wheeled around, and we started having this shouting match. And <laughs> I just had this crazy impulse to hit him. It was so stupid. But I, I, I dropped back into my front stance, and I, I hit him in what I thought was his solar plexus, which wasn't even his solar plexus. Because in class, we would never actually hit people full strength. I, and I, so I pulled this punch at the last minute. I just like touched his chest. <laughs> It was ridiculous. I mean, I wouldn't have done this if I weren't really high. <laughs> and so then the guy hauls off and hits me in the eye. But it, was a, it really felt like a moment of clarity. It wasn't really a Zen slap, as I write in my book. It wasn't because a, a Zen slap has to be delivered with compassion. And I don't think he was feeling very compassionate. But it just, I don't know, it clarified many things for me. I didn't want to know how to fight. I didn't want to have to live like this. And that this kid clearly had spent his life learning how to fight. And um, there was something, too, about, you know, over these years of studying martial arts, I'd just gotten very 
defended in other ways, just like, like you said, walking down the street with your keys, like I was just always expecting trouble. And in that moment after that, actually getting hit, I actually felt very free, like not, okay, so the worst happened, you know? And uh, there's something very liberating in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find I, when I've been, you know, in, during this pandemic, we take these I, I take these exercise classes online and there's the, the body combat one where you're doing kickboxing and this and that. And I, I'm, I have a difficult time because they're saying, now you're, you're aiming for the chin, now you're aiming for the chest. And I'm like, oh, no, <laughs> no. So I've kind of cut that out. But um, just to switch gears for a second, um, there's a really uneasy and often comedic tension in your book. Because on the one hand, you want to be strong and self-sufficient. But on the other hand, you want to be egoist and part of the larger fabric of the universe. And so as an, internet, as an introvert, a big part of your challenge is that the universe is all clogged up with people. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I mean, how does, where does your interdependence fit into your quest for, for oneness. Like, oh, Hillary, boy, you're that? getting right down to it. That's right. I don't this know. Is still I don't know. I, <laughs> oh, man. In fact, I think I got through that whole book without really addressing this question. Now's the time. Um, <laughs> it, this is my struggle in life, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like other people are this mystifying thing, like, who are all of you? <laughs> and, and you're all just as important as I am. That's the real trick, you know? Uh, so, I don't know, it's all about narcissism, like, I mean, we, we all really can't help but see ourselves as the center of the universe, but there, there's something really painful about being the only person too, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't know, it, it, it feels really hard to actually put some of this stuff in language because it sort of transcends language. Just in, in Buddhism, like, there's two levels of reality. There's absolute reality, where everything is all one thing. And then there's the normal everyday reality that we live in where we have, there's, things are separate and we have ourselves and we have others and we have subjects and objects in our language, but in the absolute reality, all of that blends together. And um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that because that's evidence for me of how hard it is to talk about this stuff, because the language itself defies uh, these ideas. But yeah, I would like to get outside of myself. That's all I want to do, but at the same time, I just want to be left alone. <laughs> See, it kind of reminds me of Scooby-Doo where the villain in the end of every episode says, like, I would have made it if it weren't for you pesky kids getting in my way. And I'm the pesky kid getting in my own no, way? Well, I thought all the, all the people in the world are kind oh. of the pesky kids getting in your way. No, Plus I think I, I get in my own way more than anyone else does. OK. I haven't seen that particular Scooby-Doo episode, but I'll be watching for it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, I have always used exercise to kind of shake the Etch-a-Sketch in my brain. And I can be upset about something and then go play ice hockey. And afterwards, even if the problem is still there, um, I, it, it feels different. And my partner is a teacher, and she's taking this class on trauma-informed in, teaching practices. And one of the things she learned is that any kind of trauma can cause us to be dysregulated, even years later. And we can get stressed or angry or upset more easily. And one way to regulate and to get back in balance is kind of rhythmic, repetitive mu movements, just as when we were young, we were rocked as children. Mm. And I was wondering if that resonates with you, and could you speak about that? Oh, I, that totally resonates for me. I really feel like, for me, exercise, especially running, which is nothing but rhythmic, repetitive movement, is a kind of being held, you know? Uh -huh. uh, 
that I just find very soothing. It's, I mean, it doesn't look like being held, but it feels like I'm, I'm coming up against this, uh, just the effort of it is of, I don't, I don't know, I can't explain it. Can't put it into words. But yes, yes, that resonates for me. So it's not just the kind of high at the end, it is while you're doing it. Yeah. 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 I like the Etch-a-Sketch thing, too. That's definitely true. Hmm. It really is something that I feel like when I am stuck in a creative challenge and I, you know, it's that kind of thing, you, you work on it and you work on it and you've got that other voice starting to get louder like, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks, this sucks. And then to leave that situation, do something completely different and exercise mode does, I feel like, create breakthroughs it does, and it's so funny because I, you'd think I would remember that, but I never do. It's like I just get so frustrated. Oh my God, I can't stand this one more second. I'm going outside, and the second I like leave the house, I get an idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the themes you have throughout the book is going outside, and it, it's mirrored through the all the the transcendentalists spend a lot of time hiking for miles and miles and hours and hours. Do you want to talk about your relationship to the outdoors? I sort of feel like I don't, because it's like, it's special and private. <laughs> it's special and private, okay. Well, I, I mean, I also, I, I feel like I have absolutely nothing original to contribute. People, there's so many wonderful nature writers and people who write about walking and the spirituality of walking and movement. I can't add anything to that whole okay. body of work, but I just know it's very vital to me. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one of the things in your book that is so important to you when there's conflict in relationships, you say, I need to live in the woods. It is important to me. Um, and I just, I, I, f I found that that was a really powerful piece for me because it was one of those times when you were uh, challenging your, your partner in your relationship to say, it's really important to me, this is a conflict and I need to stay here. Do you remember that part? Or well, that I mean, this is the story of my life. I've, <laughs> my, my ex didn't like living in the woods. My current partner doesn't like living in the woods, but we're still living in the woods. I'm not sure what, what's going to happen. <laughs> okay. Are we still in, like, body pump? <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have one more. We have one more. Um, this, this is one of the things that I, I find in your book that is, is very funny and it is true and begs to watch out for in all of your work is that there, the details are very comedic because you, you, I feel like it's, you have little commentaries um, just spread through that as you're following the plot line, um, you've got these fun things. And, and one of the, when you're talking about the comics books you read as a kid, it wasn't superheroes, it was Richie Rich. So as I was, Richie Rich was something that I had read as a kid, and I was wondering why you dropped Richie Rich, say that 10 times fast, Richie Rich um, versus presumably your, your brothers had superhero comics with every panel there's, there's superhuman strength. Um, it's just a question about, I guess, your reading tastes when you were a kid and... and I, you know, I did use Richie Rich in this book, but I also read a lot of Little Lulu. I didn't know, I don't know why I didn't... I think, I actually, as I was researching those ads, I just collected a bunch of old comics and, the, and it was Richie Rich that had some of the best Charles Atlas ads in them. I don't know why, mm -hmm. but um, so I just used that in the book. But even Little Lulu, sh she's not, you know... Oh, remember Little Lotta? No, I don't remember Little Lotta. She was in Little Lulu, and she was like this big fat girl who was super strong. She could destroy anyone. Wow. Yeah. I guess I'm curious, though, you weren't interested in the Supermans, the super whatevers, the Batmans, the, the like, the, the built. Um, no, I just like stories about real life. Like Richie like Rich. <laughs> <laughs> um, in those, in those, in 
those comics books, there were there was the Charles Atlas ad, and there were some others. Did you find yourself attracted to any of the other things? In oh, the all of those things. I wanted to get the weight gain drink. I wanted to get the like horseshoe thing that you bent. I don't know what that did for you or how it even worked, <laughs> but it, it said it would make me strong. I wanted all of that stuff. I was really into the sea monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know? That wasn't your thing? No. No? That looked pretty clearly like it was going to be disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you send for them? No, I didn't. I, that, no, I didn't. But I was thinking that if you, if you had, this could be the, the secret to superhuman shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, we're going to leave body pump. OK. Um, but um, <laughs> since you are an introvert, and I'm just poking at you, uh, I thought it would be fun to do a, a lightning fast rep workout. Oh, God. So the audience can get an inside track on you. OK. So I'm going to give you about 15 or 16 quick questions, right? OK. And it's what would you choose if you had to choose one? Now, note that these, these are binary questions, but these are non-binding. OK? So if, okay. We ever, if I ever ask you the skin and you give different ones, no problem. OK. All right, so don't think, just answer. OK. OK, pencil or pen? Pen. Pen or stylus? Pen. <laughs> Brush or pen? Mm. Mm. That's hard. Can I give a non-binary answer on that? You may. Both. Oh. <laughs> All right, that's your only non-binary answer. OK. Wings or gills? Gills. No, 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 wings. Wings. I just like the word gills, but I don't, I don't like water. <laughs> Cardio or strength? Cardio. Kale chips or protein powder? Kale chips. Uphill or downhill? Up. Cats or dogs? Cats. Cats or people? Cats. <laughs> <laughs> Writing or drawing? Drawing. Shorts or leggings? What are leggings? <laughs> Do you mean, like, like gators? No, they're not gators. They're just not. Sh they're Oh. Like every single person oh. to work out. Shorts. Okay. Shorts. Well, I, I don't know. I guess, yeah, yeah, shorts. All right. All right. <laughs> deadlines or no deadlines? Deadlines. Mm. Winter or summer? Winter. Spiders or snakes? Oh, snakes. <laughs> Ice cream or sour cream? <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to pick one? No. <laughs> Peppermint Patty or Marcy? Marcy. Mm. Good job with the reps. <laughs> oh, boy. OK. This is quite a workout. I know, because we're about to get to the heavy lifting part. OK. Um, it's about how we self-identify. And in my own growing up, I was happy with the term tomboy. It fit how I like to dress and how I like to play sports. But I want to pull up, uh, I want to talk about this one image in the book that uh, relates. So it's a picture of you um, in looking in the mirror, and you've made your shoulders go on forever. Yeah. And then I don't have the panel on the opposite page, but it's a picture of young Allison uh, on a playground. And you're up in the jungle gym uh, looking down, and you've got uh, the, the, the girls on one side, and they're doing their activities. And you've got the boys on the other side, and they're doing activities their activities, and you're not wanting to be having anything to do uh, with either. And so we're all products of our own time, but if you were growing up today, do you think that the term non-binary would be attractive to you? I do. I think I would be all into the non-binary. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I grew up in a time where <laughs> no one had thought of that yet. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I spent my life just trying to you know, carve out a way to be the strange kind of girl I seem to be. Mm -hmm. Wasn't tomboy a funny word? Like, shouldn't it have been tom girl? I never understood that. I know, it's confusing. <laughs> but I liked being called a tomboy. I liked that. Uh -huh. That felt like some kind of authentic, um, re you know, recognition of who I was. Did you I feel that? I did. I remember not not 
loving that I was being mistaken as a boy sometimes. Uh, what about you? I didn't mind it. Um, I still don't mind it. I think it's, uh, it, in, in fact, being mistaken or having people confuse me sometimes is sort of part of my way I think of myself. Like if I didn't confuse people in the women's locker room occasionally, I would feel like something was wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, that's just like the weird zone that I occupy that I've come to realize is me. And so as non-binary has kind of come into our world, is it something that you feel like, is it kind of too late for you or is it? I feel like it's too late, you know? I like mm -hmm. hashed all this stuff out a long time ago. and I don't know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll make a change, but I don't feel like I need to, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I also, we're so much part of our generations, like I'm, all the experiences I've had all of my life are, par are now part of me, and I can't just um, leave all that behind. Yep, yeah, right. Um, instead of talking about yourself, let's give you a break <laughs> and talk about the self. And a theme throughout this book is getting out of your head. And I find you talk very, very candidly, candidly throughout the book of the healthy ways and not so healthy ways that you've done that. Meditation, healthy. <laughs> Scotch and pills, <laughs> yes. not, not healthy. So. Exercise, healthy. Exercise to the point of heart palpitations, not healthy. Oh, I, I, I don't over-exercise. I just have a weird heart thing. OK, all right. And I, it's fine to exercise through it. I, you say that again? It's fine to exercise. <laughs> And, and I, I routinely have heart palpitations when I exercise, but it's not a sign that I'm being bad. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So stay with healthy. Okay. Um, work, your work. Oh, yeah. Healthy that's... and 18-hour work yeah. days, not healthy. Right. So do you want to talk about that balancing act for yourself? Don't say no. <laughs> you already used that chip. Yes, all right. And you wasted yes. it on outside. I, I know. <laughs> so yes, I do. I struggle with these things. Um, and I do think they all have a common root, like a common uh, a way of just like always never feeling quite good enough or like I'm OK just how I am. Like I've always got to strive and prove and achieve, which is a dangerous um, problem to have because you just keep getting rewarded for it. <laughs> you know, cause mm. it, 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 the more you achieve, then the more people expect you to achieve. Uh, but I don't know, it, 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 it's, it feels productive for me, but also clearly there's something else working against it. I mean, I talk in the book about finally breaking the hold of, of this drinking habit I had developed especially these sleeping pills that I was taking at the same time. Like, it took me a long time to get that out of my system, but I, I did. Um, and and this, this sounds like an excuse or a rationalization, but I, I started doing that when I started writing Fun Home, this kind of intense excavation of my family. Um, it was just hard, scary work, and I, I'm not, this is, I'm so not advising any of you to take up drinking so that you can do a difficult project, but um, <laughs> don't, don't do it, because it's very, it's counterproductive in the end, but I think that's what was going on for me, like I, I was just dealing with this scary stuff, and that's how I managed it, managed my anxiety, but then I got really hooked, and then I had to wean myself off. And so how do, you manage, how do you manage that now in a more healthy way, would you say? Uh, I feel like I, something shifted. Like, I, I, I haven't stopped drinking. I, I drink much more moderately now. Um, but I don't have that same bottomless pit anxiety that I did. I guess I've addressed it on, in some ways. And do you feel like you've addressed, what are, I guess, what are the different ways that you've addressed it that you think have ameliorated? Oh, no, you know what? Actually, it's, it's very simple. It's running. Running is a powerful anxiolytic. It's better than any um, 
anti-anxiety drug. I mean, I mean, technically, on a chart, it's like just more effective. So I've taken up running, and running addresses that bad feeling. I just have to keep running. If I, for some reason, can't run, then I'm fucked. <laughs> Um, I once took a writing workshop with Linda Berry, and she spoke about water skiing behind our, our ideas versus dragging, behind the, dragging them behind us like a barge. And you talk about loving to work. And for this book, when was it like water skiing, and when was it like dragging a barge? <laughs> um, you know, for me, the, the water skiing is always the drawing at the end. Like, I generally write first. I mean, not really. I'm always b bringing in images and sketches and stuff, but I don't really start the drawing until I've got something written. And it takes me forever to write something, and the writing is really difficult and like dragging a barge. But then the drawing is the water skiing. Mm -hmm. And um, especially the pressure of, I mean, I don't know. I, j I just need deadlines and, and pressure. And I love, I, I don't stay up all night like I did when I was younger, but I do love just working for long binges and getting into that altered state. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I find, do you find yourself like your body, do you, do you have, I have worked for long sta sta stints and then gotten up and my legs are, I'm in pain from not having moved for a long period I actually of time. move around a lot when I draw. I mean, I, I rarely sit in the same position for very long. I'm always getting up to pose and take a picture of myself. And I have a standing desk and a sitting desk. And my chair goes up and down. I'm, I'm very fidgety. So I don't ever stay in one position very long, which is helpful. Which is smart, kids. <laughs> um, in the acknowledgments, uh, you thank your wife, Holly, for devising drawing exercises to get you out of a creative rut. Can you talk about that and how that came to pass and what kind of, uh, what kind of things yeah. that you would do? <clears throat> we started doing this thing like where we would plan our week in a, in a bullet journal. Do you guys have, you know what a bullet journal is? I don't, we don't really do the bullet part, but we have a journal and we'll plan out our week. And it, we started doing that for a couple months and then on the spread where you put the activities, there's all this empty space. So we started, I started just putting little drawings there. And then eventually, Holly said, draw this. And she told me what to draw. And it was at a point while I was working on this last book when I wasn't drawing. I was very stuck in all this writing and research. And um, she started telling, giving me these drawing assignments, like draw us looking at an old chestnut tree. She was reading a book about chestnut trees. So, OK, I'll draw that. And then every week, she would tell me a different thing to draw. And often, we'd get in a fight, because I didn't want to draw this, or I didn't like her idea. And I, 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 she would always <laughs> override me. And I would always end up making the drawing and feeling really happy about the drawing. And it became this thing. And now every week, for years we've been doing it now, I, I make a drawing of some, her idea. You know, you, you shared something uh, in the slides in the beginning that I wanted to ask you about. It was when, I, when, you sh when you showed me that um, brush drawing of, oh, of us playing badminton. Of us playing badminton, you mentioned that you do a daily brush drawing, and I thought I thought that would, I was I didn't know that, and I I wanted to hear how you incorporate that practice into your day, when you do it, how you do it, and what you get out of it. Yeah, this is something I started doing in about the same time as that weekly journal thing, and for the same reason, just to keep, just have a, just be drawing when I wasn't drawing. And it's kind of stressful, because it's, it's just a quick drawing. It literally takes a minute, but I often don't do it, and I end up having to do like four, four at once or a whole week. But the whole point is to do it every day, and to just do it really quickly and not think about it too much, because I want to capture some real moment of that day. I, you know, the older you get, like, days just, blur, weeks, months. You can't remember individual parts of your life. And I wanted to preserve moments. Um, I guess we'd sort of do that in photographs, but there's something that you can get 
and a drawing that actually, I feel, transmits some of the energy and feeling of that moment. And it doesn't work if you wait two days or three days. It has to be immediately. Is it something you do before you go to bed? I will. I would, see, this is the thing. I, ideally, I would do it first thing in the morning, and it would be about the day before. Uh, but I never managed to do that. <laughs> it always gets kicked off till later in the day. Uh-huh. And do you just travel with a brush and some ink, or, or what do you use? Well, I'm usually not traveling lately. I haven't been traveling. I just use a brush and uh, watered down ink. Excellent, excellent. That's really interesting. Um, since we're talking about work and we're at an art school, I thought it would be really interesting to, for you to share with oh, the yeah, community. Oh, yeah, I forgot we were going to do that. Yeah, about how the sausage is made because the way that you draw each panel has this athletic and, and kinetic um, uh, aspect to it. So here's the clicker. OK. Yeah, I'll just walk you through how I do this. It's, I, I do most of my writing, well, I do, I do all of my writing in Illustrator, although I'm switching now to InDesign, because it's too boring. I won't tell you. Um, but I get it all print. I get it all the way I want it, and then I, like here, I'm recycling a drawing I drew years ago for some other project. But mostly, I don't have the drawings done at this point. I just have descriptions of what the drawing is going to be. So I print this out, and this is this is not a great slideshow. I'm sorry. Um, no, people like process. I, people like process. Well, stuff. I could have done a better job. The, this page is about karate. So I. To, to make the drawings, I just did a lot of online research of people in a karate class. I ran across my old karate teacher who I didn't realize had died. That was interesting. I do all these poses for, um, these aren't actually poses from that page, but um, like this is what I'm doing. I get up from my drawing table and run out and do this. Or this is a, a drawing I made when I was like 20 and I was actually doing karate. And I like that because it has, it, because I was doing it when I was doing the karate, it has some of that kinetic energy in it. Yeah. So I use all of that stuff to make my sketches for that page, my pencils, and then, well, what's that? These are just rough sketches and then going over them with a marker. I do a couple layers until it gets more coherent. And then this, I guess, is my pencil. I can't really see that. The final pencil, ink that. Um, and then I'll talk just a little bit about how I colored this book. I know, I'm not a color person. I, for many, many years, all I did was black and white, um, you know, just cross hatching. And with my memoirs, Fun Home and Are You My Mother, I didn't have time to cross hatch those, so I used ink wash, which got tinted. I didn't really work in color. I just the art design, the you know book designer turned my gray ink wash into these colors. For this book, I wanted to do color, and I came up with this insane method. Um, I can't. I don't know if I can even explain it. Well, so I didn't have time to do it myself. My partner Holly helped me with this. I should say she did, she did it all. Um, I would do a, a very minimal color sketch. It's like the purple sky and the gray ground. And she would um, just color these in, but she wasn't using color. She was using gray ink wash, which is what I have always worked with. And in, she was making color separations. I'd give her my instructions, which had like, OK, blue sky, green tree. And she would fill in that tree on the green layer and the yellow layer. It was crazy. Like She, she had to figure all that out. And so what, what she would create is, like, here's the cyan layer for that page. Here's the magenta layer for that page, yellow. And then we added a gray layer just to give it a kind of richness. So we, we, it would be gray until we put it into Photoshop, and then there would be the colors, and they would all get layered together. And 
Uh oh, what's happening? The, then the line art goes on, um, which is a really weird, crazy roundabout way of doing like old fashioned comics coloring. And newspapers. And That's newspapers. How they do yeah. it today, yeah. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, we went to all that trouble, but I, I, I like it because it kept the colors, I think, somehow very pure. You know, like if, if we'd actually been working with watercolor, I think it would have just gotten all muddy and gross. But there's a kind of luminousness to the color that I really liked. Anyhow, so that's how I, that's my. Would you do it again? No, I would just do watercolor. <laughs> it was fucking insane. For Christmas, for Christmas, Holly gave me this stack of these pages that she'd made. It was literally this high. I put them under the tree. Oh my gosh. What, now you had always been a, a solo flyer. So what was it like to fold in a, a, a spouse into your work life? And you have this funny part in your book, the way you and Holly met. Uh, she was polyamorous. Um, now this is turning into the Terry Gross interview. <laughs> Terry Gross is very interested in the polyamory. Oh, hats off to Terry. Um, we don't know what goes on at on in Philadelphia. No, we don't. Um, but one of the things that really made me laugh is you're like, okay, well, is you can be polyamorous as long as I can just be polyamorous with my work, like. I'm in a relationship with my work. I thought that was quite fair. <laughs> well, oh, you're undressing now. I am. Um, so do you want to talk about what it was like for you to, um, to, to work collaboratively on your project? It was dicey, I won't lie to you, uh -huh. at times, at the beginning. It's very hard for me to let go of control and there's no way I could control exactly what she was doing. Um, but we, we got through all that, and it was then really quite wonderful. It was all during the middle of COVID, and everything was shut down, and we were just like locked up in the house on this assembly line, and it was, it was fantastic. Yeah, great. Do you think that that's something that you might continue on with other projects, or do you feel like this was the pandemic project. I, we talk about collaborating on a kid's book or something. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like our weekly drawings where she tells me something I would never have thought of or done on my own because it always takes us to an interesting place. So I think I would like to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, this is the last question before our, our cool down. Um, <laughs> But what have, what have you come to know about yourself that you didn't know when you started the book? Hmm. I'm very tricky. I always like to think I know everything. I don't want to admit that I didn't know something about myself. Um, maybe that's it. Uh, realizing that I'm not the invulnerable, perfect person I'm always striving to be and I'm never going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I think I'm, I, it's not that I know that, it's that I'm accepting that a little more. And is that something that gives you ease or gives you sorrow? Much more sorrow. I mean, e ease. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wait, which is it? Hoist by my own petard. <laughs> It's both. It's both. Yes. Uh -huh. Got it. Got it. Um, the internet tells me that Dykes to Watch Out For has some, um, something happened. The, the, there's going to be an animated show on Netflix. Uh, no? There, there, the internet might be, there might be an animated show, and if there is, it won't be on Netflix. It'll be something else. But it's all sort of in the big, Hopper. Okay. It's right. it's not ha, 
it's possibly going to happen. Oh, all right. Sorry, internet. Is, are there any projects that are, that are in the hopper, hopper that you're feeling like you can share? Um, a, a, a cool thing that's been happening is an Audible, like a, you, you know how Audible does like people reading books? They're gonna do a. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting late, you guys. <laughs> um, they're doing a like a like a radio play of Dykes to Watch Out for, and it's really cool. I I didn't write it, but this wonderful playwright, who's actually the partner of Lisa Crone, who wrote the musical, the, wrote the book of the musical of Fun Home. It's like this <laughs> weird like cottage industry. Um, Madeline wrote a wonderful play using a lot of my character's lines verbatim, but somehow weaving them into a coherent narrative, like so there's half hour episodes. And it, they're gonna like get actors to read them. That's really exciting. How cool that a, a medium that is so visual is going to be turned into something that is absolutely just yeah just audible. Yeah, um, I bet they're doing all these fun things with sound effects and music. It'll, I think it'll be really cool. That is really neat. So uh, we're, we're coming up on the hour here. So um, what's going to happen is that uh, we're just, well, I've got a little thing to give you, oh, Allison. Oh, it's just, <laughs> it's just, um, is it in an ice? Chest? It is, it is, because um, a good recovery drink is chocolate milk oh, at the end great. of the workout. Thank so, you. <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that. <laughs> so um, thank you guys for having us in conversation, and there's going to be a Q&A after. So. Hey, Allison. Oh, is this on? Hey, Allison. Hey, Laura. Hi. This is Jeff Smith. You've met him before. Yes. Hey, Jeff. Hello, Allison, Hillary, Dr. Korn, gang. <laughs> uh, first, I just want to say I feel like we got to witness something kind of special here tonight. I don't think you were very comfortable, but you were awesome. <laughs> 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 it, it, it was really special. Uh, but why I'm standing here is because um, there are, there's no shortage of really brilliant pieces of work in our field. And there's quite a few that even rise up and up and up above the others. But every now and then, there's a work that's like dropping a pebble in a pond. And it ripples out, and it changes things. And it makes people see our field differently, it makes people in the field feel differently about it, and it changes things. And uh, every year at CXC, we want to recognize one of those works. And Allison, of course, Fun Home is one of those works. So, uh, will you explain that beyond that, and I will dig this out. So, okay, I'm just gonna talk real loud. <laughs> I'm used to that. So, uh, for the Transformative Work Award. There we go. That's pretty. <laughs> wow. For Fun Home, given to oh. Allison Bechdel because of your amazing skills, wow. not only at the technical work of creating a comic, but the self observation that the exercise that you went through in having to delve into your own life in such a memorable and transformative way that made all of us take graphic memoir in a completely different direction. We award you the Transformative Thank you so Work Award. Much. This is amazing. Thank you. It's super heavy too. It's a good thing I lift weights. And so now we will uh, have the Q in the A. <laughs> Are there Qs? Oh. All right, if anybody has a question, raise a hand. Oh, yes, you are the best. You get the gold star. 
with our students. Yeah. Oh, and here comes somebody with a microphone. Oh, great. I get to speak. So the way I'm very loud, though. Okay. No, the way. Oh, I want. You want me to come out? No. Okay. The way Q and A is going to go okay. due to COVID is you're going to say your question. I'm going to repeat it on the mic. Okay. Oh, wow. What were your specific color choice techniques for your book? I am terrible at color. I, I, that's why I never worked in it. In fact, I think I became a cartoonist because it was a, an art form that didn't use color. I mean, at least in the kind of comics I wanted to do. Um, so I've pushed myself to do color, but I, it's not something I am good at or have an instinct for. I just did some just really basic stuff like, OK, I'm going to mostly wear a red shirt. And we'll just try to make stuff fit in around that. Um, there, was a, there were a lot of landscapes and skies in this book. Um, and you know, here, here's the real reason for that color separation thing is I knew I wanted to do color, but I knew it was going to be a lot of work. So I came up with what I thought was a simple color scheme, which was going to be, OK, I'll just, I'll just use cyan, magenta, and yellow. And where they overlap, we'll get secondary colors, and it'll be kind of fun and interesting. And somehow that turned into this much more naturalistic coloring scheme. I, don't, I can't remember what, why or how that happened, but it was supposed to be just like easy little spot colors. Um, but I, that's why I remained attached to doing the color separations, because those colors were so pure. But that's all, that's all I have to say for myself about color. There's another. Here's somebody. Oh. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> Can you repeat the question because I I, I I didn't hear it, so you have to repeat it, right? <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, oh, that, that's a little loud. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't get all oh that it, in my mind. <laughs> Javier, what, what's your question? Oh, what drew me to doing a comic that was countercultural as opposed to something else. I never considered doing anything else. I couldn't do anything else. Uh, I, you know, for me, coming out at, at 19 or 20 was very connected for me with drawing. Uh, and when I started. I can't remember my life anymore. <laughs> Have some milk. <laughs> I'm trying to say that it, I, it wasn't possible for me to do comics about anything other than my own life, which is the life of a young lesbian trying to figure out her, how she fit into the world. I couldn't have drawn, like, Kathy or... Uh, <laughs> Calvin and Hobbes, like none of those things were possible. Um, that, and, and he, those types of stories weren't possible. All I could do was my own thing. So I'm very lucky that it worked out the way it did. But it wasn't, it wasn't like a choice. I mean, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay. <laughs> Question. Uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on the uh, contemporary art movement of our generation and its large presence online? 
Um, I, can you repeat the question for everyone? Y yeah, I didn't quite get that question either. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, have you seen any of the art of our generation and like, you know, it, all of it online? And if you have, what are your thoughts on it? Um, yeah, I, I, I saw a lot of it today uh, <laughs> on the tables out front. Um, I am amazed with how it seems like young cartoonists are just so much better than I was at their <laughs> age. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. But I think people, I think that the, this language has become, people are learning it sooner and better than, um, well, that's probably not true historically, but it, it, it's true of me. Like, I didn't, I didn't learn stuff the way you guys are learning it. Um, so it's super impressive, don't you think? Oh, yeah. I mean, anyone can draw better than I can, so that's, that's just right there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think some of the question was, was it about it also appearing native to the internet? Is that, is that another part of the question? I'm getting oh. some head nods. I don't read a lot of web comics personally. Mm -hmm. uh, do you? I I don't. No, no. I mean, my my the genre that I tend to. Well, I spend a lot of time looking at a screen for work, and so yeah. it makes my eyeballs hurt to to look for pleasure in in there. And I feel like, um, I feel like there's. With a, a younger generation, the internet isn't a place to visit. It's a it's a place to live. It's they're native to that world in a way that I feel like I I dip in and I dip out. Yeah, yeah, me too. So God knows what you're getting up to. <laughs> Hi, um, so. I think what I struggle a lot with as a comic artist is like translating my words into art. So what is it something you work on or like what are ways that you can more easily like translate such like rich feelings and words into your comics? How, what are ways of translating your Huh. Hell if I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I would be a terrible, terrible teacher. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, is, it the, is it that you don't enjoy the drawing? words into the art. There's like some oh. things that are lost oh. in translation. Oh, OK. Ah, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you practice. You do it for 10,000 hours, and then you know how to do it. I think just keep trying, and you'll figure it out. That's really good advice, Allison. <laughs> <laughs> um. What, what made you want to publish Fun Home at, in the year that you did, considering how, how long it, it had been since your father's passing, how long it had been since you had this sexual awakening in psychology? Like, what was the thing, that, the straw that broke the camel's back where she's like, I have to tell the story? That's a very good question. She is asking, what was the straw that broke the camel's back? Why did I t start? writing Fun Home when I did, when it had been so long since these things happened in my life. And I was 39 when I started writing that book. Um, and it had been like 19 and a half years since my father had died. And so it was this weird midpoint. Like my father had been alive for half my life and dead for half my life. And somehow I feel like that tipping point, that distance from that all those traumatic events suddenly gave me enough perspective on it all to, to start seeing how it could be a story. Um, I was going to say something else, but now I can't remember. 
But that's the, that's the gist of it. Well, also, I didn't have the skills before that. And also, I didn't think I could, I, th I didn't think I could tell this, these family secrets. I didn't think I could reveal those. And so I had to reach a certain point of feeling like I could navigate that with my family. And also, it wasn't as bad as it had been. Like, it, there was so much more social acceptance for being gay, for people who committed suicide. Like, there was just this more understanding uh, world. So all these things went into that timing. Um, when you're writing, I notice that you often like don't obviously write in a, like a linear narrative way. And I was wondering like it, in your process for writing, does it come out that way? Like the first time you write it, like, oh, it makes sense to do this scene next, even though this happened 10 years ago. Or is this something that you have like some sort of master sheet somewhere, and you have a bunch of like crazy string and pins connecting everything and planning out. <laughs> yeah, the latter. <laughs> a lot of crazy string and pins, and um, it's funny because I, I the, the book I just wrote, The Secret to Superhuman Strength, ha happens in chronological order, which was a very odd way for me to work. In fact, as I was writing that book, I, I couldn't. I had to keep jumping around in the book. Um, but yes, for Fun Home, for Are You My Mother, the, the narrative is very, you know, kind of circular. It goes, it goes around and twists and turns. And that, it, that's just something that I get to with a lot of work. Um, it does not come out that way by any means. It's a, lo a lot of labor and um, it just, uh, just, I don't know how people tell stories. It's so fun. It's such a fun challenge to tr try and figure out how to put all this information together. And you just have to sort of turn yourself over to it. I, I, I do. And then um, that's how that narrative logic happens, just by <laughs> doing it. <laughs> another, another great piece of advice from Alison Bechtel. <laughs> Hi. Um, too close. So you both talked earlier. I'm over here <laughs> about um, solitude, the joy of uh, solitude through exercise. Oh, here, here. Thank you. Hi. Um, you you've each talked about the joy of uh, solitude. What? <laughs> You don't gotta do that <laughs> with exercise and also of uh, community through sports. And comics is this medium where you take a lot of the private and then later you just kind of make it public. I'd just be interested in hearing both of your thoughts on that. How does the component of exercise versus art uh, interact with sharing something that's like private versus public. That's a good insight. I like that. You go first. Um, and repeat well, the question how you understand it. Oh. This person is saying, oh God. <laughs> it's so hard rephrasing questions. You put that so beautifully. Um, so we're talking about sports. And there's a way that it's a, a solitary activity. But there's also a way that sports is a community activity when you're on a team. And there's a way that comics is a solitary activity, but also a way that it puts you in contact with the wider world. Um, and for me, I, I, I do these, I do my comics, which are often like insanely personal and intimate, because I'm tr trying to get out of my own little crazy cocoon and connect with other people. But I can't do I can't I have to be in the cocoon <laughs> to to do the work and then I can come out and do stuff like this like look here we all are in a room together with I have my mask off like um, I can't do this every day but doing it occasionally is really amazing. Phew. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
my, my take on it is a little bit different. I, I, I think early on, well, I've always been seeking community in the creative process, but for a long time, I, I, I didn't really have that option. Um, I, would, I had this ritual where I would, my office mate, I would buy her breakfast every Friday and I would show her the blue pencils. And she was a graphic designer, so she understood you know, the relationship of words and pictures. And I really loved this Friday meeting, A, because it was this uh, soft deadline, um, and B, because I could talk to somebody about what it was that I was doing. And then um, at when in the syndicated cartoon world, you have these long contracts, and you can't change anything until the contract was up. So about four years ago, I was um, finishing up a seven-year contract. And I had come to that place where I was feeling like I was always giving it my all, but it was taking more and more out of me. And so I wanted to collaborate on Rhymes with Orange with somebody. And the person I had in mind was this other cartoonist from Toronto whose stuff I'd loved since the 90s. And so for the weekday part of the strip, Sundays I still do on my own, but for the weekday it's a more collaborative process. And I found that that is something that works, that I enjoy. I just want to be part of a team. Um, and, and we're the right mix for one another. So I feel like that's changed over my, my career and something that I wish I had been able to do sooner, but you can't, you can't push something that's not, that you can't do. So um, when I'm doing a strip, then it shows up four or six weeks later, and there's two good things that happen. One is I get feedback, and uh, people will say, hey, nice strip, and, or not. They might say something else. But um, I've also had that time where that, that judgmental little fiend that's on my shoulder um, has, has napped or been distracted or something like that, so I can appreciate the work later on in a way that I can't after you've just been working and staring at something uh, for many hours. So I hope that answers uh, the question. Thank you, guys. And we're going to take one more question here from our friend in brown with the glasses. They're going to say it, and I'll repeat it in the mic. Do connections to literary or artistic works inspire you naturally during the artistic process, or does that come afterward? I feel like you're you're asking, you're saying, I, I do talk about all these, I make these literary references. Are you saying, are there also art references? That I don't, I don't do that as much as I used to, but I, I used to always look at um, our crumb if I needed to draw a tree. <laughs> hmm. uh, and eventually I sort of made, made, made these things my, my own, but I, would, I, I did copy other people a lot. And now I can't remember. I'm so like aged. I can't uh, think of who, who my like, comics idols were. I mean, I, I, there's lot, lots of cartoonists whose work I love, but the ones who I actually copy their techniques, um, some Art Spiegelman, I guess. Um, do you copy? I, I, what I do when I'm trying to, to figure out a problem, a cartoon problem, 
I'll go and look at how other people have solved that problem, how other cartoonists have solved that problem, yeah. versus you know if I need to do a, a, a building or something like that. I might not look at the actual building, but I might look at 10 different cartoonists take on that actual building to kind of help me figure out the how I want to represent it. Yeah. Oh, Hergé, too. Even though my style is so the opposite of his, I always, I just love his, his visual language. I love your little Tintin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my homage. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much to Hillary Price and Allison Bechtel. A signing. <laughs> there is going to be a signing in the lobby, Pamela? Yes, there will be a signing in the lobby uh, right after this, and uh, I will see all of the freshmen and the seniors on Wednesday. <laughs>